And that gets down to the issue of why we are pushing, and the CDC is, first of all, they don't have any symptoms, most of them, or they're in a situation where they don't even notice the symptoms. A lot of them, I mean, it's very tragic where someone comes into my hospital with a devastating pneumonia, which you know they've been infected for seven years, which means for seven years they've been infected and they didn't even know that they were infecting other people. What the CDC is trying to do and has done is to make HIV testing a part of routine medical care. Now, believe it or not, it isn't. You go in, I mean, if you broke your leg and you went into an emergency room or you had some other, other uh, non-related issue, they would draw a sh blood sugar, they would draw a few things, a hematocrit, et cetera. They won't ask you and say, ma'am, would you please sign this? And if it's, if it's positive, we're going to have to get you to a diabetologist for your blood sugar. They just draw it, that's it. That's routine medical care. You can't do that with HIV in many states. Now it's becoming more and more that you can. You've got to ask permission, have a special signature, and you've got to be counseled before as to what happens if you're positive. Even though the intention of that is a um, uh, well-meaning intention, it logistically has gotten in the way of testing a whole bunch of people. So now what we have is opt out. You come in, draw the blood, and say, I'm going to draw an HIV test on you. The only way I'm not going to do it is if you tell me no. I'm not going to waste a half an hour counseling you. I'm not going to ask for a special permission. When we do that, we're going to capture a lot more people very early on after they get infected. So that's the purpose of changing the atmosphere. And the reason for the previous philosophy was understandable. There's a lot of stigma, discrimination, loss of insurance, loss of jobs, et cetera. As, and we were making that an obstacle to routine medical care. That's different now. So, and unfortunately, many of the people who are the groups that in the United States are more likely to get infected don't have access to routine medical care. So it's kind of like a catch-22 because if you look at the new infections in the United States, there are that 40 to 50,000 new infections. Of the new infections among men, 49% are among African Americans. Of the new infections among women, 65% are among African American women, even though they comprise 12% of the population, and the reason is where you happen to be. You were in an inner city, there's a lot of drug use, crack cocaine for sex, young African-American girls who are monogamous with a partner who's an injection drug user or, or even a reformed injection drug user who didn't know that he got infected three years ago. So there's a lot of healthcare delivery issues that are part of this whole big complex HIV thing. Tony? Yeah. Yes. Um, if somebody's on that sounds like Bill Hazeltine. It is. If somebody is on uh, effective HIV therapy, uh, do they transmit? And what what degree does it inhibit transmission if they're on effective therapy? Uh, and if that's so, wouldn't a strategy of uni if it, if it does dramatically reduce transmission, wouldn't a strategy of universal uh, treatment with combination therapy? be a prevention strategy? Absolutely. Uh, what, what Dr. Hazeltine has brought up is, is an important point that tends not to get um, emphasized because of a concern that it would um, induce or favor behavior that's risky. So it's almost like letting the perfect be the enemy of the good. And let me explain what I mean by that. What Bill was referring to is that if you're on effective therapy, your viral load, most of the time, if you're on the right therapy and you're taking your drug, will go to below detectable level. And we know from a number of studies that the probability of transmitting infection, if you are infected but your viral load is so low, of transmitting it is greatly, greatly diminished. Not zero, but greatly, greatly diminished. Now, the reason people are hesitant to say that, I'm not, is that they're feeling, if you say that, people say, okay, I'm on treatment, I'm infected, I don't have to worry about infecting anybody else. The issue is, is that if your viral load is below detectable, 
you're not going to very unlikely infect somebody. But people who are on therapy occasionally get blips in their virus. So if I'm infected and my viral load is undetectable uh, in July, and then for one reason or other I get a viral illness and it activates my immune system and it goes up to a few thousand copies, and then I say, wait a minute, the last time I looked my viral load was undetectable so I can have sex without a condom, that's risky. But in the big picture, what Bill is saying is that universal therapy, availability for everyone, which we're not quite there yet in the United States and we're only 30% there in the developing world, is a major, major way of preventing. And that we can't deny. Yes? Uh, not everybody who is exposed to this virus becomes infected. Uh, are there, are, is there a way to look at those people and say, what is special about those individuals that preclude them from right. getting the disease? Or is that a possibility? Are people actually uh, not able to acquire this disease? Well, not everyone who gets exposed gets infected because this is, relatively speaking, under normal physiological circumstances, a very difficult virus to transmit. So the vast, vast majority of people who get exposed and don't get infected are lucky. There's nothing special about them. There's a very, very small fraction of the population that have genetic determinants that make it very difficult, if not almost impossible, for them to get infected, who have a defect in one of the receptors that the virus needs to enter. That's 1% of the Caucasian population and 0% of the African American population. So it's not a good condom, if you want to think metaphorically. So there are other things that make it much easier to get infected. Other sexually transmitted diseases, ulcerogenital disease. Believe it or not, uncircumcised men have a much greater likelihood compared to a circumcised man. That doesn't mean you have a great, well, the likelihood is always low, but when you compare circumcised to uncircumcised, the uncircumcised person has a greater probability of getting infected because in the foreskin of the penis, the number of cells that are very, very permissive for HIV entry are very highly concentrated there, as well as other issues of small abrasions, et cetera. So there are reasons why, if you have a given sexual contact, you may or may not be at a big risk. Very few of them relate to a genetic thing that relates to an immune response that you can actually apply to a number. We've tried that. We've spent years looking at these people who are so-called protected. You learn a lot about the genetics of it, but you don't learn a lot about the immune response to it. 